Blessed be God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Grant us, O Lord, to, to trust you with all our hearts. For as you always resist the proud who confide in your own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Say to those who are fearful of heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless will sing with joy. For water shall break forth in the desert, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Think his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke, spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Collect for Labor Day, let us pray. Almighty God, you have so linked our lives one with another that all we do affects, for good or ill, all other lives. So guide us in the work we do, that we may do it not for self alone, but for the common good. And as we seek a proper return for our own labor, make us mindful of the rightful aspirations of other workers, and arouse our concern for those who are out of work. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Labor Day, which honors the American worker and indeed all workers, seems a good time for us to consider what work means to us as followers of the Jesus movement, as part of the Jesus movement, and how we might be able to begin to develop our own theology of work. The pandemic has turned work on its head. Starting in March 2020 and continuing to this very day, our places of work, our opportunities for work have vastly changed. Women have been disproportionately affected Grandparents and great-grandparents have been called into service. People in the hospitality industry, mostly people of color, have been devastated. We will have a new normal, but not yet. Because in this day and age, even before the pandemic, work seems all-pervasive to many of us, perhaps it is helpful for us to think about work, what work is not. It's not necessarily something you get paid to do. It surely is not limited to nine to five. It often doesn't take place at a different location, which we used to call the office or the workplace. It takes place wherever we are. It doesn't end when you receive your first social security check or pension payment for those very few of us who are privileged to even know what those words mean. Even what we wear to work has been turned on its head. It seems that we often get tied up between the difference of work and vocation. Lots of people distinguish these by calling work the thing that we have to do and vocation the thing that we have passion to do. I think that's actually a false dichotomy. We're called to practice our vocation, our calling, wherever we find ourselves. So let us speak today of our work, the work we do as Christian people. The work that involves our whole being, our passion, the work that God is calling us to do, not over a lifetime, although most of us are working all of our lifetime, but right now, today. Joan Chittister is one of my favorite religious authors and speakers, and she says this about work. She says, 
Work is not a private enterprise. Work is not to enable me to get ahead. The purpose of work is to enable me to get more human and to make my world more just. The purpose of work is to enable me to get more human and to make my world more just. <coughs> With Chittister's definition, we understand that the act of caring for a sick friend or family member is work. We understand that intimate relationship is work. Does anyone want to share out loud, just shout it out, what is the work that you are doing? I'm kind of famous for this, getting the congregation. You may not want to say anything, but that's all right. Anyone want to share just briefly what the work they are doing is? Mentoring young girls. Mentoring young girls. Fifth grade teacher. Thank you. Spiritual direction. Spiritual direction. All of us are doing work which is important. One of the things that I tell the congregations I serve is that often elders will say, well, I'm not, I, I'm just at home, and I'm praying for people, and that is perhaps the most important work of all. All of us are doing work. Think about the Bible. The Bible is essentially a book about work. We start with God's creation, and we end with a vision of the creation of the New Jerusalem. The work of the prophets, of Jesus and his followers, take up of all that comes in between that first and that last canon of the Bible. The Bible gives us words for our salvation story of God creating Jesus and his follower, transforming the Holy Spirit, stirring up the work that has already begun in each of us. And this shared history is what inspires us and motivates us and urges us past ourselves. Again, in the words of Joan Chittister, we work to get more human and to make our world more just. So let's take this morning our own work that we're doing, which has been spoken and spoken to you quietly in the spirit this morning. Let's take our own work and hold it up against this gospel and see the good news of Jesus in this very strange story that we have heard this morning. The gospel story is a hard one. Don't make any mistake about it. There is no sugarcoating about what goes on in this story. Modern preachers and biblical scholars alike agree that in this story, Jesus uses a slur. Often it is understood as a racial slur. Many call it, at the very least, a very disrespectful form of address. He calls the Syrophoenician woman a dog. Now, it's also true that many commentators also say, well, he was just being human, as if that excuses his brutal address. But what we know, each one of us, as people of faith, is that this follow-on commentary is not needed or helpful. It excuses something wrong that has been done. We must not excuse Jesus too quickly, or we miss the entire reason for this story in Scripture. Because we know that Jesus is fully human and fully divine, that one cannot be separated from the other, then we also must not forgive before we stand in the Syrophoenician woman's place. Her, an outsider, a person inferior to Jesus in every cultural way, asking for healing for her daughter. And he calls her a dog. This is what it means to make the world more just. 
even when it means standing up to the teacher, which is what the woman did. And for Jesus, his work, his spiritual work, is to get himself more human. To realize the error of his ways and to make things right both for the woman and for himself. Jesus heard and proclaimed the woman's standing up to him and declaring her truth. And in that act, the daughter of the woman is healed. And in that act of hearing and receiving and becoming more human, Jesus himself goes and heals the deaf man. That's the second part of the story. The deaf man whose ears are open and who begins to speak. Healing has occurred. Jesus knew that work makes us human and makes our work world more just. He knew that that is the work of the heart, even if he was initially, initially unable to understand this as the story began. The one who was healed, Jesus, turned and offered healing to another. How are we to respond when we prayerfully listen and realize that we have done something wrong? All of us have examples of that, and I won't ask us to share the names. <laughs> but it is something to prayerfully ponder. If we take our own work that we are doing today and hold it up to this teaching, what might we see? seems that this is the work that all of us can benefit from on this Labor Day weekend. As a community which is called St. Paul's in Burlingame, part of a community which is called the Diocese of California, part of a community called the Episcopal Church, how might we take this story into ourselves? How might you ponder what this teaching might lead you to do in your communal spiritual work during this time of transition? In this interim time? How about speaking out when you encounter injustice or find yourselves inadvertently participating in it? How about refusing to participate in all ways? How about honoring the work that you are doing, whether or not our culture puts a price tag or prestige on it? God, on this Labor Day Sunday, let our work make us more human and our world more just. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
prayers of the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Mark, for this gathering, our final one online, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people, particularly those who have been impacted by Hurricane Ida and all those who live in areas of conflict, whether or not personal or in their neighborhoods. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, people who live oppressed, and those who are in prison. We pray for those in any need or in any trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God, for a deeper knowledge, for a deeper practice, the spirituality that understands wholeness and lives in the spirit of welcome. I ask for your prayers for the departed. At this online gathering here at St. Paul's, we pray for the following people. For Roger Wright, for Delane, for Craig Costa, for military gold star families, for the Murdoch family, especially Charlotte, for the Gura family, especially Dylan, and for Walt Marcus, and for anyone else you would like to pray for this weekend. Perhaps in particular, we'd like to pray for essential workers and all those who work in our community. Good and gracious God, you continue to bring us together so that not only we can praise your name, but we can ask for the things that we need. Now we pray in the words that Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen.
with rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia.